The internet is a wonderful place full of many beautiful things. But then there are the horrors. I'm Aiden Mattis and welcome back to The Lore Lodge. In the year 2014, Waukesha, Wisconsin was a nice little borough, a nice little city of about 65,000 people. And in this nice little town, everything was good and dandy until it wasn't. Founded in 1834 by settlers mostly from New England, the little village was known as Prairie Village, then Prairieville, and then finally was named Waukesha after a local Native American chieftain. According to local legend, this is because the area was formerly owned by the Potawatomi, who are an Algonquin-speaking group who are cousins of the Ojibwa of the Ontario area. Back in the day, an alliance existed between them, the Potawatomi, and the Ojibwa, as well as the Ottawa. And these Algonquin-speaking tribes would gather together to fight against both the British and the Americans on multiple occasions. And during Pontiac's Rebellion, a major revolt of Native American tribes against the British after the War of 1812, they were extremely successful against the British, taking most of the frontier forts with the exception of Detroit. However, much like most other Native American tribes, eventually the Potawatomi were relegated to reservation lands over in Oklahoma. After that, European American settlers moved into the region and established many of the cities we now know in Wisconsin. Nearly 200 years later, Anissa Weyer, Morgan Geyser, and Peyton Leutner were born. Now, according to the families, Weyer and Leutner were not the closest of friends. They hung out occasionally when they were both hanging out with Morgan, but Morgan was kind of the, the key member of this little group, the one who actually brought the two together. And on this occasion, May 30th, 2014, they were all gathered together to celebrate Morgan's 12th birthday. And speaking of birthdays, June 12th was the Lore Lodge's second birthday. We've been here for two years, and we have something pretty cool as a result. One of our followers, who goes by Jacked Up Kicks on Instagram, a guy named Jack Garcia, decided that he was going to design some brand new Lore Lodge-specific van sneakers. We worked with Jack to pick out a specific type of shoe and then to add in a Lore Lodge design that really carries through, you know, everything what, that we do here. We think it's really cool, we love these shoes, and we're really excited to tell you that if you reach out to Jacked Up Kicks on Instagram, you too can get a pair of these shoes. But I believe he's only accepting the first 500 orders, so that's not us trying to be like, there's, there's false scarcity, da, da, da. No, he makes all of these by hand, so he can only do so many in a certain period of time. So if you want to get yours in the next six months, you should probably order them. To order, just go to this little Instagram handle, it's also linked in the description, and you can get your shoes from Jack at Jacked Up Kicks and support the Lore Lodge at the same time. But, back to the story at hand. On May 30th, 2014, Morgan Geyser, Peyton Leutner, and Anissa Weyer all decided they were gonna go stay overnight at the Geyser household. That was, of course, Morgan's house. Peyton Leutner would be coming over to the Geyser household later, so right after school, Anissa and Morgan went to Anissa's house to pack up the normal sleep sleepover stuff, you know? Your sleeping bag, your pillow, your granola bars, your water bottles, pictures of your mom, your dad, and your siblings. It seems that the two had bigger plans that did not involve returning to school on Monday. But that night, which of course was a Friday, Geyser's father picked them all up and drove them to Skateland, a local roller rink, to just have some, you know, simple 80s style fun in 2014. It seems that the 80s were back even before Stranger Things. The three girls all stayed at the roller rink to about 9.30 p.m., at which point Mr. Geyser picked them up to take them back to the house. Now, at this point, if you're familiar with this story, you probably have figured out where this is going and what we're about to discuss. But if you're not, I need to tell you that this is a story about two teenage girls who decided to kill one of their best friends for Slenderman. I'll get into the exact details of their motivations for this, but right now I just want to tell you the story of what actually happened so we can talk about that stuff on the back end. According to reports, Morgan and Anissa planned to, at about 2 in the morning, duct tape Peyton Leutner's mouth closed. They then planned to stab her in the neck and pull the sheets up so it looked like she was just asleep. At that point, they would run, partially because they did not want to watch her die, and partially because they did not want to get caught. But, as the time came, and it was 2 a.m. and time to do this, for whatever reason, the girls gave different reasons, they decided that they would let her live until tomorrow. But this presented a problem. They no longer had their perfect scenario to put their plan into action, so they had to come up with something different. The new plan was to go to David's Park, just a local nature area for them. Anissa Wire remembered that there was a bathroom in that park that had a drain in the floor, which of course, if they were going to kill somebody and hide the blood, but not the body, 
they were going to do it in the bathroom, I suppose. I'm not entirely sure why they thought that having the blood go down the drain would be better than having the blood just pull around a body, but I'm not a 12-year-old girl killing for Slenderman. And this entire thing went about as you would expect it to go with, again, a couple of teenage girls trying to kill somebody. When they got Peyton into the bathroom, Morgan tried to restrain her, but according to Anissa Wire, Morgan had kind of a nervous breakdown and just couldn't, couldn't get it, couldn't do it. Now, what exactly transpired here and how Peyton didn't realize that something was off is unclear, but it seems like they never got close enough while in the bathroom for any alarm bells to ring for Peyton. They decided that, you know what, if we can't pull this off here, maybe we can do it in the woods. And there was a spot of forest nearby, so Anissa suggested that they all play hide and seek. They went out into the woods and Anissa told Peyton, hey, you should hide in that pile of leaves. But Peyton didn't want to hide in the pile of leaves. It's possible that at this point, because what Anissa had said was she should lie down in the leaves face down, that maybe Peyton was starting to notice that something was up. At this point, Anissa seems to have gotten tired of the games and trying to make it seem like Peyton shouldn't know what was going on, so she just shoved Peyton to the ground and sat on her, waiting for Morgan to come out and actually go in for the kill. But Morgan didn't appear and didn't attack, so Anissa was forced to get up. Exactly what happened next is pretty murky, but it seems that Morgan got there, and at some point Anissa yelled, Go Ballistic! And at that point, Morgan tackled and began stabbing her friend Peyton a total of 19 times. Now, she mostly got soft tissue, but she did manage to also hit the liver, stomach, diaphragm, and she missed Peyton's heart by about a millimeter. According to Anissa Wire's account, Geyser did all of the stabbing, but according to Morgan Geyser's account, Anissa did take a few stabs towards the end. When describing the event to the police, Morgan used the words stabby, stab, stab to explain killing her best friend. And then as they got up to walk away, after Anissa told Peyton, hey, don't move, you'll bleed out slower, we're going to get help, Peyton obviously did not believe her because she had just been stabbed 19 times, she yelled out after Morgan specifically, I hate you, I trusted you. Peyton, to her credit, considering how badly wounded she was, did manage to get herself up enough. At first she stood up and stumbled around, at which point Anissa and Morgan realized she wasn't getting out of there on her own and decided to leave. But after they had left, she was able to drag herself to a nearby road. Also, if you look at Google Maps, this was not like the middle of the forest. This was basically just in a small park. So I'm not sure why they thought she wouldn't be able to get help if they didn't finish the job. Uh, I'm glad they didn't finish the job, just not great planning. Anyway, Peyton managed to drag herself to the side of the road where a passing cyclist saw her and called 911. Then, just hours later, because of course their victim was still alive and talking to police, Morgan and Anissa were apprehended walking along I-94. Incredibly, the knife was actually still in Anissa Wire's backpack, still covered in blood, and according to police was about a five inch kitchen knife. Now, in most cases, when somebody commits a crime and is caught, you expect them to plead guilty or to say, no, no, you know, you, you have it all wrong. You expect them to defend themselves, especially in the case of a crime like this. But that's not what happened. Anissa and Morgan both readily admitted to police why they did what they did and even gave detailed reasoning. And that's because the girls genuinely did not think they had done anything wrong because they thought they had to appease Slenderman. Now, if you are watching this channel, there is a very good chance you are aware of what Slenderman is and where Slenderman came from. But in case you're not, I think it's a good time to describe what Slenderman is from like, not just the, you know, he's a dude in a suit with no face, but let's, I dove into the Slenderman mythos. I downloaded the 194 page document and I read it. And from there I constructed what you're about to see. Back in 2009, the website, the really more of a message board forum kind of website, Something Awful held a Photoshop contest. They thought it would be fun, because this is a, primarily a comedy board, they thought it would be funny to Photoshop fake paranormal images. There's a whole thread of this. Some of them were actually pretty damn good. But one submission by a user named Eric Knudsen depicted a tall humanoid figure in a suit with long, slender arms and legs, black tentacles protruding from its back, and no visible facial features. That being became known as Slender Man, and it very quickly became one of the best-known creepypasta figures on the internet. Of course, we might refer to The Rake or Ted the Caver as the first creepypasta, but this was 
probably the first creepypasta that really made it out of that community and into a much larger mainstream. Even if you don't know what a creepypasta is, there's a good chance you know who Slenderman is. Internet series like Marble Hornets, which is fantastic, I highly recommend it, that developed within months, and then by 2012, independent studios were releasing games like Slender, which eventually became Slender the Eight Pages. And of course, that first game came out in 2012, just three years later. And much of the information, much of these original stories about Slenderman, this collective fiction, was compiled into what is called the original Slenderman mythos. And as I said, that is a nearly 200-page document, including things like woodcuts, military reports, anecdotes, and even photographs of Slenderman. And some of these go back centuries. There are woodcuts that are allegedly from like the 1550s. I, and I say this as, you know, somebody who does this for a living. It's, it's good. It is really good. They, they mix fact and fiction in the, the most subtle of ways. So you can tell how a 12 year old girl back in 2014, reading this on the internet, might be able to think, okay, this is actually something real. I mean, think about who you were at 12 and how gullible you were, the stuff you believed in. We all had crazy stuff we thought of. Like, for example, when I was a little kid, we thought that Michael Jackson was the first transgender person ever. I don't know why, but that was a myth that went around. Do you remember that one? I don't, actually. Maybe that was just my school. Now, within that document, there are a few pictures of things like hieroglyphs that kind of look like they have Slender Man or cave paintings, but it starts to really get intense in the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance period. One of the first really solid examples is Baldung's Three Ages of a Woman and Death, which in this universe, in this mythos, when you put it under a certain light, you can tell that the figure of death used to have several more limbs protruding from his back. Now, of course, this was photoshopped in, but that is a real painting by a real painter, and they just simply manipulated it a little bit and then created a different story for it. I think they refer to him as Baldurg or something like that. But Baldung's 1510 piece isn't the only German piece. The 1526 and 1538 woodcuts, Der Ritter and The Dance of Death, or uh, The Dance Macabre, both are included, but they're different. They're not their originals. According to Mythos, these three images were created by Hans Baldung and another guy named Hans Freckenberg, who of course is not the real artist. But according to the mythos, Freckenberg's works are typically very anatomically accurate. In fact, unusually so for the time. But if you look at the image on the screen right now, you'll see that the knight to the right side in Der Ritter is not anatomically correct. And in The Dance with Death, which is of course in a similar vein, you'll notice that the figure that is leading the small child out of the house does not look like a human, nor does it even look like our depiction of death. The mythos also claims that Freckenberg simply disappeared from Hallstatt in 1543. Now, of course, all of this is edited history, but it's really close to the real history. If you look at the original Del Ritta and the original Dance Macabre, you'll see that they were only slightly changed. Only one figure was, and they didn't even really change them all that much. In Del Ritta, they just added some legs to the kneecap plates. In the Dance Macabre, he's taller and he has more limbs, but he's still a skeletal figure. And the real Freckenberg, Hans Holbein the Younger, a Swiss German artist, did in fact die in 1543. But it was in London, not Hallstatt, and it was most likely of an infection, not a Slenderman attack. And I'm not saying that it was possibly a Slenderman attack. I'm saying we think he died of an infection, but there were other possibilities that were not a Slenderman attack. Be very clear, Hans Holbein the Younger did not die in a Slenderman attack. And then aside from woodcuts and paintings, there's also folklore from Europe that's given. While it's noted that England and Germany share this creature, the exact folktale that is given is from Romania. And if you've been watching this channel, we have a video on vampires that'll tell you exactly how weird Romanian folklore can get. In that Romanian folktale, the two girls, who are the central characters, are described as being very brave and very obedient to their parents. And they are off picking berries in the forest with their mother when they come across something strange. They see a tall man dressed in the outfit of a nobleman just standing there in the clearing. And in this story, this all is occurring just before noon, so Slender Man does not only appear at night. And this is how they describe the tall man. Shadows lay over him, dark as cloudy midnight. He had many arms, all long and boneless as snakes, all sharp as swords, and they writhed like worms on nails. And then, according to the story, without 
speaking a single word, nobody else hears this but the mom, Slendy orders her to do something. She tells one daughter to draw a circle on the ground big enough to lay in with a knife and tells the other daughter to crush berries in the circle. Now, these instructions don't make any sense to the girls, but they decide because they're very brave and obedient girls that they're going to do it anyway. She then orders one of the girls, Stella, to lay in the circle and then orders her sister, Serena, to cut her open. Serena, of course, refuses, and then her mother tells her that if she doesn't do it, it will be much worse. Serena runs home and tells her father, who grabs an ax, locks the door, and says, don't open the door till I get back. And then later that night, there's a knock at the door. But Serena just gets the feeling it's not her dad and says so. Of course, whoever's on the other side of the door says that, oh, well, I'm your sister. She's like, eh, I don't think you are. Then finally, it admits it's the mother, and she says she's not gonna open the door, so the mother naturally just blasts the door down, just breaks it down. And then the mom tells her daughter, there is no reward for goodness, there is no respite for faith, there is nothing but cold steel and scourging fire for all of us. And at this point, the tall man emerges from the fireplace, wraps his arms around Serena, and she is no more, is the way it is worded. But the stories don't end with rural folktales from the old world. There's another one from 1966 in Elizabeth, New Jersey. According to that story, two young men out on a walk on October 11th, 1966, came to the corner of 4th and New Jersey, adjacent to the turnpike. And if you've ever been to New Jersey and been on the turnpike, you'll know that Jersey drivers are considerably more dangerous than Slenderman. The story says that the turnpike was separated from 4th by a high wire fence and itself was raised anyway, so there was a steep incline before where the men were and where you got to the actual highway. And, importantly, it says that the area was very well lit. They told police and reporters about the strangest guy we've ever seen who was standing on the other side of the fence just looking at them with a little grin. The investigators who followed up learned that the man was at least six feet tall, dressed in a business suit that seemed to absorb the light, and that he was pale with no facial features except for his mouth. And then in 1987, residents of Sterling City, California, experienced a rash of pet deaths. Now, authorities were attributing these to the fact that it was a harsh winter, and maybe some wild animals were getting a little bit closer to town to hunt for animals because they were lacking food out in the wilderness. But the problem was the animals that were being found dead were disemboweled, but didn't appear to have actually had much of them eaten, which is very weird behavior for most wild animals. It was just written off as being, you know, mountain lions or something like that. One father said that his family's cat had been, you know, well, disemboweled and that his daughters were pretty traumatized about it. But still, the authorities did not see anything wrong with this outside of the normal course of wildlife. Until a couple months later, when a young girl named Katrina Elkins went missing. Her sister, who shared a room with her and was named Alice, said that the last thing she saw was her sister out the window hugging a tall, faceless man. Naturally, investigators just chalked all of this up to a traumatized child with an overactive imagination. After all, just a couple months earlier, her cat had died. Alice had more to say, though, telling police that a tall man would tap on the glass and make faces at them, and that the night Katrina went missing, Alice had heard her conversing with him. Which means that the tall man had actually been coming up to tap on the glass for at least a couple of nights, and this was not something random to Alice. This was something that she'd been experiencing. She also claimed that the tall man beckoned to her after her sister left out the window, but she was scared and she refused to go. Police, of course, saw no link between the disappearance and the dead cat, because why would they? Years later, consider this was 1987, but years later, in 1993, Alice went missing. A Crystal Park Reiner, who was ostensibly also 16, told police and reporters that Alice was one of her friends and that they were out celebrating her birthday. According to this story, after Katrina's death, Alice's parents had kind of not done a great job of parenting her or being there. Now, of course, this being a bunch of teenagers having a party, they were in the park, they had alcohol, they had cigarettes, but Alice wasn't touching any of that. She wasn't really interested. The party started around 7 p.m., but according to Crystal, Alice spent most of the time kind of hanging out on the periphery, looking out into the woods, and just generally seeming like she wasn't there. And then suddenly around 9 p.m., she just got very quiet and walked off into the woods. And her friends chased after her, but it seemed like she was following something, like she was being led somewhere, not like she was just in a trance walking through the woods. And they started finding discarded clothing of hers, but they lost her. 
And according to that story, she was never found. And then we have accounts that are military and police related. One such document is the account of an OSS agent, which of course the OSS, the Office of Secret Stuff. Aiden, what is it? The Office of Strategic Services. I like Office of Secret Stuff better, especially considering it was the precursor to the CIA. And I will say this much, the story that is given here, way cooler than anything the CIA actually does, and not giving, you know, LSD to Charles Manson, which is something they did. If you haven't yet picked up on it, we here at the Lore Lodge are not fans of three-letter agencies. But as the story goes, and it's being retold by the person who was there's grandson, he says that he was watching a story about missing children, and that his grandfather suddenly got really weird, and just a little uncomfortable looking at the TV, because this was a story about missing kids, and they thought that some sort of tall man in a suit with tentacles was abducting them, and he looked at his grandfather and was like, you know, what's, what's up, you okay? And his grandfather launched into a story about not missing children, but about World War II. He and his unit were on a mission deep in cover in Germany's Black Forest region. They were gonna be meeting up with somebody who was supposed to give them stolen Nazi plans that they would then be able to use to further the offensives against Germany. But while on assignment, they encountered a Nazi soldier who had a broken leg and was running away from something screaming. And as they got close to him to ask him what was wrong, he started screaming, he's coming, oh my God, he's coming. Do not come. And then they ended up seeing a tall man in a business suit with no face, except for a very small mouth, and he was approaching. It snatched up the German guy, and the Americans did what Americans do best and started blasting. I started blasting, bang! Wow. Problem was, Slender Man just kind of absorbed the bullets. And then once it had the German soldier well within its possession, it just vanished. And then another tale comes to us through either the military or the FBI. The way it's worded is kind of weird, because the people involved have military titles like Major and Colonel, that I don't believe the FBI has. But the story makes it sound like this is in fact an FBI investigation. But it comes to us through Major Thomas Whitmore in writings to a Colonel Stephen Bittman. And these are about an ongoing S-Man investigation. The first of the documents from this investigation is a memo which is describing the actual timeline of events from a specific instance during these Slenderman investigations. This one is dated to October 23rd, 2007. At 2 a.m., a husband and a wife pull into a police station. Both have wounds requiring bandages on them. At 2.30 a.m., the husband and wife both give statements to police, and the police note that they are covered in blood, human tissue, and what appear to be bone fragments. At 3 a.m., the police notify the FBI. Simultaneously, they send a set of officers to the scene of whatever happened to the husband and wife, which is not included in this document. At 3.15 a.m., they lose contact with that team. At 3.30 a.m., the husband and wife, who are at this point in an ambulance en route to the hospital, get out at a red light and run away. They are never heard from again. At 4 a.m., FBI agents arrive at the police station and set up a perimeter. At 4.15, agents are sent to actually go find the missing investigative team that the police sent, and they very quickly find what appear to be intestines in a clear plastic bag. Then at 4.20 a.m., the FBI team finds a bunch of corpses hanging from trees in a circle, and some of them are clearly the police officers. And these bodies had been disemboweled, and their organs were in clear plastic bags placed within their bodies. Their intestines were missing. This saga continues with another memo dated a week later on October 28th, 2007. This is not a timeline, but rather an update on the progress of the investigation. According to this document, another attack has occurred, this time in Yellowstone, or near Yellowstone. Analysts note that it seems this thing prefers forests because it blends in well with the trees. Whitmore then notes that the team that was sent to retrieve the bodies has also been lost. Now, it's a little difficult to tell exactly what happened here, but I think I figured it out. It seems that apparently five men ended their own lives after coming across all of this because of what they saw, and then a sixth, a Sergeant Connor, is being kept sedated in the hospital because he seems to have bitten off his own tongue and did something that is not mentioned but is clearly horrible to his own brother. And then a November 15th report from the same Whitmore details that he is having problems now. He himself has developed insomnia and likely other mental problems as a result of all of this, and he also says that while data has been collected and the scientific community says it's important, he's worried about the fact that he has now lost about 12 men on this project. And despite all of the important data they've supposedly collected, Whitmore says they still have no idea what this thing is or how it works. They don't know if it moves, if it breathes, where the fog that always seems to surround it comes from, or precisely what it looks like. 
because they, they can tell that it's faceless and tall with tentacles, but they have no good footage. And then the next thing we get in this saga is a discussion between Major Whitmore and a Major Thomas, or sorry, a Major Thompson. Thompson appears to have witnessed an attack firsthand, saying, it came, it came to us. I'm gonna come. Whitmore asks clarifying questions, trying to figure out if it approached or if it just suddenly appeared, like what was it doing before it attacked? Thompson said that it appeared out of nowhere, didn't seem to display any sort of movement aside from the tentacles going a little and then it would just teleport from place to place. Whitmore then asks about weapons because none of the bodies seem to have any like blade or gunshot wounds on them. Thompson says, and I quote, it came and they died as it did. They couldn't fire at it implying that it actually also just, they, they, they couldn't even start shooting. It can have that much of a psychological terror effect. Whitmore asks if it touched them, but Thompson doesn't know. He says that he couldn't tell, he just saw them fall down and die. In fact, he says he heard their death rattle. After that, it traced a line down their bodies and they just kind of split open. At this point, the interview ends and there are no further entries in this saga. But of course, these are all just stories, right? Can you really believe them? Well, once the photographs get involved, it's a little easier. Modern cameras allowed for a lot more captures of Slenderman out in the open, but interestingly enough, in a lot of them, it seems pretty clear that the person taking the picture doesn't see Slenderman. And interestingly enough, Slenderman's exact size varies from picture to picture. Some he's about six feet tall, in others he's as tall as the trees. I do find it interesting that this has some involvement with German and Eastern European folklore, because there is a creature, in some cases it's a deity, in some cases it's a spirit, depending on which exact tradition you go with, but there's this creature called the Leshy, which is a forest guardian spirit. And unlike Slenderman, it's not malevolent, it can be either helpful or harmful or totally neutral, but it does vary in size depending on the size of the trees and plants around it. So it could be as small as a blade of grass or as tall as a tree. So it is interesting to see how actual little tidbits of folklore make their way into these internet legends. In most, but not all of the images, he is also partially obscured by something. He'll be behind a tree or in some fog or around the corner of a building, which interestingly enough also ties in with a creature called the hide behind from American folklore. This mostly ties back into old logging and mining camps where lumberjacks would say that they kept seeing something peeking out at them from behind the trees, but every time they went to really look at it, they'd see it in their periphery. Every time they went to focus on it, it would be missing, it would be gone. And of course, the only way to protect the hide behind, to protect yourself from the hide behind, the only way was to drink because it did not like the scent of alcohol, which of course could be a, a good old down home American folk horror story, or it could have been a very creative excuse to drink. I will allow you guys to be the judge. The fog is also an interesting aspect because nobody seems sure from the reports whether he brings the fog or whether the fog brings him. But in a few, he is plainly visible in the picture, like only 20 feet from the person that's taking it. He is very obviously there, but nobody seems to notice him, which is why I said it seems like he's not always, it seems like he doesn't always appear to his victims unless he wants them to see him. One such image shows about nine or so children at the park, Slender Man just vibing in a circle of them, and nobody seems to notice he's there. Now, the photo is dated 1986, and allegedly it was found in the remains of a burned down library. Also an interesting thing about this entire story, it seems that capturing him on film makes him more aggressive. Another photo included here shows three people at the Wilkes estate, and this one is dated to 1995. It appears to be depicting a family taking a selfie in an antique mirror, and of course, selfie with a flash camera, but in that picture is Slender Man in the mirror. Apparently the power went out and the sole surviving witness had complete amnesia from what happened next. That witness was named Gloria Creedy and she was in a mental hospital. And without detailing events, a document labeled May 25th, 1995, tells us that two of the other uh, witnesses couldn't be interviewed uh, and that the camera was covered in blood and human tissue. So we can kind of extrapolate why they couldn't be interviewed. Analysis determined that Slender Man had no eyes, no nose, and while initially they had thought the tentacles in the background were just an artifact or that it was just some problems with the camera, they've determined that these are now appendages. That update was given June 7th, 1995. And then on June 10th, 1995, 
Gloria, along with the staff and patients, about 33 of them, at that mental hospital she was staying at, they're all missing. Then on the 18th, the entry says that all inquiry into what has happened has been halted, which implies that things got considerably worse, and also suggests that Slenderman will continue to hunt down those who he fails to kill the first time. Finally, another image from Steinman Woods depicts a foggy forest and what appears to be a hunter in, in the background. And of course, also in the background, a man with some tentacles. According to that story, two hunters went in, one hunter came out. And it doesn't say which one this happened to, but apparently a body fell out of a tree onto one of their shoulders, caused a negligent, well, not negligent, but an accidental discharge of a firearm, and that when we looked at the body itself, it was missing its intestines and all the organs were in bags. And throughout all of this, it said that a fog was rolling in and a low murmur could be heard, and then right before the attack, it crescendoed into the sound of giggling children. One of the two hunters did not survive, but the one who did booked it for his car, and then as soon as he thought he was safe, stopped and like freaked out. Then after being interviewed, he was classified as a B7 witness and placed into a blind box until resolution. None of that is explained anywhere in the document, but we can make some assumptions about what that means. And this is kind of the way that all of these documents work, is they are these believable snippets of information about things Slenderman did. It's, you rarely get somebody who's like, here's everything you need to know about Slenderman. It's little bits of evidence of him, which I think could be why somebody could have, you know, being less media literate and less internet literate, thought this stuff was real. But what does that document tell us about Slenderman? I've just gone through a whole bunch of stuff, so let me summarize. He is visible to the naked eye only when he wants. So right before he's attacking, it seems, but otherwise it doesn't seem like he just appears to you. You can't just always see him. But it seems that photographs can always capture him. He is always dressed in the upper class attire of the era. As we know in that Romanian folktale, he's dressed in the clothes of a nobleman, but now we see him in a business suit. He moves by teleporting, or at least he seems to move by teleporting, because most people do not say that they saw his limbs move. They just say that he appeared and disappeared. When possible, he seems to enjoy using manipulation to get people to do his dirty work for him, either telepathically or through some sort of unknown magic. After all, a mother was willing to kill her entire family for it. His very appearance seems capable of shocking people into so much terror that they're unable to even move or fight back or even run away in many cases. Those who see him but escape tend to go insane and then go missing, implying that once again, he is capable of completely breaking your mind and also, that he hunts down people who witness him. And in some cases, including that of a man whose location was redacted, when Slenderman is feeling really aggressive, he can just break down entire walls, get into your home, cause a considerable mess of blood and tissue, and then disappear with both you and your dog. And then there's also the Marble Hornet stuff, which implies that he does have followers or worshipers or people who encountered him and decided that, you know what, this is, th this is their guy. It's, you know, or maybe their minds broke too, who knows? It's like Hoodie and Masky are their names in Marble Hornets, which obviously aren't their real names, they're alter egos for other characters, but I'm not gonna ruin that for you. And Marble Hornets seems to be one of those things that like, it has its own canon for Slenderman. He's referred to, I think, as the operator, not necessarily Slenderman, but their version of Slendy is, uh, they took some liberties, basically. Not quite the original Slenderman. But that's not to say that in 2014, which is well into when Marble Hornets was running, that somebody couldn't watch those, which are of course very well done found footage, and think, oh my gosh, this is real. But like I said, I wanted to explain what happened and what Slenderman is before we got to the section where we're gonna talk about motive here. Because once again, this is a video about a very real crime that occurred. And we need to ask the question, how did all of this lead Anissa Wire and Morgan Geyser, who are now both adults, to commit the crime they committed? According to Peyton, as well as other students from the school, Morgan and Anissa were obsessed with Slender Man and talked about him nearly constantly. Of course, Peyton, who also believed that Slender Man was real, at the time that they were initially talking about it, found him very frightening, didn't like the mythos, and often would not like to be involved in these conversations, which just brought Anissa and Morgan closer together and likely contributed to why they picked 
her as the person to slay. At one point, Peyton's mother, Stacy, had to sit down with her, go through the Slender Man stuff and be like, does this really seem real to you? At which point Peyton was like, no, no it doesn't. Now, according to documents from the time, a lot of people talk about Slender Man and they talk about the Creepypasta Wiki and Marble Hornets. A lot of the reporters, it's clear, were not as familiar with the internet as someone might be now, and the fact that there are far more places where you can find stories about Slender Man other than Reddit and the Creepypasta Wiki. It's important to remember that we're talking about the year 2014. This is the golden age of fan fiction. These girls were most likely also on Tumblr, Archive of Our Own, Wattpad, and possibly other fan fiction sites. And I spoke to some people who have read some of the Slender Man fan fiction from back then, and it's important to note that the exact word used by Morgan and Anissa when they were telling everybody what was going on was that they wanted to be proxies. Now, a proxy for Slender Man in the Marble Hornets universe might just be somebody who is killing on behalf of that creature. Proxies in certain stories on Archive of Our Own, Wattpad, Tumblr have a, a more explicit aspect to them. And the thing is, I could try and figure out exactly which Slender Man story they were reading, but that would still be speculation because I can't possibly tell, and they probably read all sorts of them. If they were that obsessed, it's a, there's a good chance they read anything Slender Man titled that they could get their hands on, which on, on, on websites that don't have great filtering for what minors can and can't see, because it all relies on self-reporting of your own age, there's, there's very likely some stuff they saw in there that was not appropriate for 12 year old girls. And when you look at the fact that, I'll, I'll get to the mansion aspect in a second. I'll say this much, based on what of Marble Hornets was on the internet at the time and the stuff they said, it seems very unlikely to me that they were basing any of this stuff on Marble Hornets, which is why I'm saying, you know, the, the obvious one that you might say, oh, well, if it differed from the main material, maybe it was Marble Hornets. It does, it's not, it's not Marble Hornets. According to interviews with the girls, they were planning on doing a lot more than just killing somebody to appease Slender Man. Beginning around Christmas 2013, Anissa suggested to Morgan that they kill Peyton, and that in this way, Slender Man would accept them, they could become his proxies, and they could go live with him at his mansion. You can understand why I have some assumptions about what kind of fiction they were reading. Anissa Wire told police that Slender Man was the leader of the creepypastas, and that in the hierarchy of that world, one must kill to please him. That, that second part was a journalist paraphrase, to be clear. And for some reason, which I can only assume is related to fan fiction, they thought that he lived in a mansion in Nicolette National Forest, which is about 300 miles from Waukesha. Now, this was 2014, and in 2012, a game called Slender Man's Shadow came out, which did include a mansion map, but that mansion is not in Nicolette National Forest. Maybe the girls thought, well, the mansion's in a forest, and this forest's here, but that was an oddly specific one. There's also, of course, the possibility, and this is pure conjecture, that they were talking to somebody on a forum who talked them into doing all of this for their own nefarious purposes. So there may be levels to this, but I don't want to say that that is what happened, because I have no evidence of that. And once again, yet another reason that it seems like fan fiction was involved here is because there's no real Slender Man mythos from the established stuff that tells you what happens after Slender Man accepts you and allows you to live in his mansion. In fact, the word mansion does not appear in the 194 pages of the mythos. So none of the articles from the time, at least none that I can find, explain what the plan was after kill Peyton, hike 300 miles to Nicolette National Forest, find mansion. Someone must have written a story that told them what was gonna happen once they were at the mansion. So that's, that's all of the, you know, external motive that can be established here, but there's also internal stuff. There's stuff that needs to be mentioned about the mental state of both of these girls. A Kathleen Hale, writing for Hazlitt in 2018, wrote that the court documents reveal further information about the girls' mental states. She says that Wire's internet history and her social media showed her sharing videos of animals killing each other, tutorials on how to commit murder, and failed psychopathy tests. A lot of this was on Google+, if you remember that. For those that don't know, back in the early 2010s, Google had a failed social media platform of their own, and honestly, looking at Google now, thank God. And this all makes sense because when she was interviewed by police, Anissa Wire told them that the good part of her wanted Peyton to live and the bad part of her wanted Peyton to die, which implies that 
she did not have an internal understanding of right and wrong, much like some sociopaths. And then when it comes to Morgan, an article in the Milwaukee NPR affiliate says that she had been known to have schizophrenic tendencies since the age of three, but was never diagnosed. Now, at some point she was on medication for it because it appears that medication was withheld while she was in jail and her situation worsened, which while it's, you know, obviously unacceptable that these girls did what they did, it's also unacceptable to withhold a schizophrenic's medication from them while they're in prison. So it's unclear when she actually was diagnosed, but her parents did say that she experienced visual hallucinations that intensified at the onset of puberty. And then Anissa Wire had a learning disability that caused her to struggle when reading things with determining what was fact and fiction. Some sort of probably psych, it's not quite psychosis, but it's adjacent. And this is, again, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist. This is just what I gleaned from a quick scan of the internet. So this was a perfect storm of problems. Anissa Wire is the one who introduced Morgan Geyser to Slenderman. Anissa Wire was unable to tell that Slenderman was a fictional character, partially because of her own learning disabilities and partially because the Slenderman mythos is so well done. So this girl who has a learning disability that causes her to not be able to tell the difference between fact and fiction, introduces a girl with schizophrenia, which also makes it hard to tell fact from fiction, to Slenderman and therefore convinced Geyser that this creature was real as well. Now, under Wisconsin law, murderers, violent criminals over the age of 10 can be tried as adults at the judge's discretion. So in this case, they are, the way it worked was they said, we're initially going to move it into the adult court, but her lawyers, their lawyers can petition to have this moved back to juvenile court. It ended up staying in adult court. Morgan Geyser was found not fit to stand trial because her delusions had worsened in jail because they had withheld her schizophrenia medication. And in the end, both girls were found not guilty by reason of insanity. Nonetheless, they still did do what they did and they did need to be rehabilitated. So Morgan Geyser was sentenced to 40 years in a mental hospital and Anissa Wire was sentenced to 25 years in a mental hospital. Those sentences might seem pretty harsh, but it's important to remember that in Wisconsin, you can actually appeal to have those, uh, you can appeal for release every six months. So their lawyers said, we're going to be routinely appealing for release. The idea was that you give them the longer sentence so that there, there's, th so that it's basically on them to get better. It's not the state is not gonna let them out before they're better. But there's something else I wanna point out as well, which is that after being apprehended, Morgan Geyser was asked if she felt remorse, and her answer is interesting. Because she said no, but it wasn't a, a no because I don't have feelings, it was a no because I thought Slender Man was going to kill my family. And because she fully believed Slender Man was real, this drove her to commit the crime. She told detectives that he could teleport and read minds, and even asked if it was legal to kill somebody in self-defense. When asked if she thought this was self-defense, she said no, but again, 12-year-old. So it seems like maybe she thought that for some reason Slender Man was gonna be after her family. And while I can't say for certain, I do wonder if perhaps Anissa had something to do with that. Of course, this was all fairly recent back in 2014, and I think that their sentences were given down in 2018. Anissa Wire was actually released in 2022 with some restrictions, including that she wear an ankle monitor and that she does not contact Leutner until after 2039. Leutner, for all her trouble, is actually doing great. She is either a junior or a senior at this point at an undisclosed college, and she's doing very well. She has plans to go on and use this experience to drive her to become a, a medical doctor or perhaps a psychiatrist, and that is where she plans on taking her career. And she even says that she's kind of thankful for this happening because it gave her direction in life. At 12, she obviously didn't know what she wanted to do. Now, at around 21, she knows she wants to be in the medical field. And you know what? That's pretty good. So while this story is pretty tragic and horrifying for a large number of reasons, the good news is it has a relatively okay ending. Peyton Leutner is doing all right for herself. She survived. She seems like she's on a good track. She's not suffering too much, even though she does say it has affected her pretty severely, but she was able to not let this drag her down and keep her from experiencing and enjoying a full life. And additionally, Morgan Geyser needed medical treatment. She needed mental help and she wasn't getting it. Now she is, and the same goes for Anissa Wire. So while this story certainly was not the best way any of these girls' lives could have gone, at least it didn't end in somebody losing their life. 
and I think that that's something we can all be grateful for. Now, with that said, if you like what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can support our growth by subscribing to our Patreon for just $1 a month, you can also check out those swanky new shoes from Jacked Up Kicks that we mentioned. We also have a coffee brand that is Mount Pocono Perk from Tableau Roasting Company, and the link to that is in the description. If you like these videos, but you also want Q&As and you want to catch them in a live format, we have a show Sunday nights at 7 p.m. That is a live stream. It is an hour and a half long, and we do a Q&A for 30 minutes at the end. You can also get an ad-free experience here on YouTube by becoming a member of our channel. And if you want to rock some Lore Lodge style, we have you covered. I do a whole bunch of designs for our t-shirts, and our hoodies and all that over at the lorelodge.shop. We also have two other channels you can check out that will be getting more content this summer. Those are History Hut and The Weird Bible, which are similar to this, but more focused on those two topics. And of course, if you would like to keep up with this community, the best way you can do that is through our Discord server, which you can reach either through the link in the description or by going to bit.ly slash join the lodge. I'm Aiden Mattis. Thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.